Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start, at the very least, on my review of The Bullet That Missed by Richard Osman. So I'm currently about a third of the way through. Um, I've been reading a lot whilst on the exercise bike at the gym, so I'll be reading some more later on today. But I want to uh, do my usual, so I'm going to read you the blurb, I'm going to check out what tabs I have so far, and then I'll update you later on. And then finally, when I've finished it, I will give you my overall thoughts and ratings. So, Dane reads. Welcome to the Thursday Murder Club. It is an ordinary Thursday and things should finally be returning to normal. Except trouble is never far away where the Thursday Murder Club is concerned. A decade old cold case leads them to a local news legend and a murder with no body and no answers. Then a new foe pays Elizabeth a visit. Her mission? Kill or be killed. Can the gang solve the mystery and save Elizabeth before the murderer strikes again? Uh, so this is, I think, book number three in this series. I do kind of wish more series would put the number of the book at the front of it, you know? So right at the beginning we get this, I guess you would call it like uh, a prologue, um, where part of the murder victim we see kind of her, her last acts. And um, yes, she writes a text message and we get, she writes a message and presses send. He won't reply tonight, it's late. That's probably for the best. She can hear his voice now. Who texts at 10 p.m.? Millennials and sex pests, that's who. Well, I'm a millennium, but I, I, I don't text at uh, 10 p.m. I, uh, you know, what would WhatsApp? I wouldn't use a text. That's for people older than millennials. So Ron is going on TV and um, we just get this little bit of conversation here when he's getting his makeup done. Um, this is Pauline. Hello Pauline, says Joyce, you got your work cut out there. I've seen worse, says Pauline. I used to work on casualty. So this is all part of a ruse to get Mike Waghorn, who is um, the guy who was getting the text message in that in that prologue, uh, a TV presenter, to come and meet the Thursday Murder Club. And um, Mike, he, Mike, he gets invited to dinner and Mike's not sure about it. And Joyce says, and we can tell you about the Thursday Murder Club. The Thursday Murder Club, says Mike. Sounds made up. Everything is made up when you really think about it, says Ibrahim. Which is true, there's a line which I think is a missed opportunity in one of my favourite shows, Peep Show, um, where the father and it goes, uh, they're talking about playing Pictionary, and he goes, I don't want to play Pictionary, it's a made up game. And it's like, well all games are made up. Um, and there's a similar joke actually in a different season I think of it, where Mark, the main character in it, is getting his book published by a publishing house called British London. And uh, his friends point out, you know, that sounds a bit made up. And he goes, of course it's made up. Everything's made up. Penguin is made up. Do you think it was published by a penguin? Which would be nice. Speaking of which, this is published by Penguin. So we learn about Amber, Mike's new co-host. Um, and Mike says, she's terrific. Goes to the gym a lot, but terrific. Which I just thought was fun, because again, I was reading this on the exercise bike at the gym. And Bogdan, who's probably my favourite character, um, he has a lot of great lines, such as this one. Everyone wants to feel special, but nobody wants to feel different. So there are a lot of characters to keep track of here, but it's it's not undoable, you know? Um, so we've got the police, so we have Chris Hudson and Donna DeFritas. Chris is dating Donna's mum. Donna is sleeping with Bogdan. Um, but anyway, I... Uh, <laughs> so they're, they're out on the beach, and because they're both kind of in love, they're seeing the positive side of it. And I just enjoyed this. Uh, Chris narrowly avoids stepping on one of the many needles strewn alongside the minibus. Heroin addicts love the beach. Perhaps he will grow old with Patrice. Watching box sets and going to farmer's markets. One hand, one heart. She's just made him watch West Side Story and it actually wasn't bad once she got past the singing and dancing. Um, which amused me because I'm, I'm not a fan of musicals, so I would be the same. I mean, when you get past the singing and dancing, it's just Romeo and Juliet, isn't it? And I just thought this was fun as well. Uh, so we're learning a bit more about Chris and Donna and their boss, Andrew Everton, um, who he crops up a little bit later as well, but he's an indie novelist, so it's just funny to see an indie right or the indie culture I suppose being kind of covered in a book like this. Chris and Donna have recently been in to see the Chief Constable of Kent, a man named Andrew Everton. Good copper, sticks up for his troops, but merciless if anyone crosses the line. He writes novels in his spare time too, under a pen name. The Chief Constable publishes the books himself and you can get them only on Kindle. Another officer was telling Chris that's where the real money is these days, but Andrew Everton still drives an old Vauxhall Vectra, so it may not be true. And we get this, uh, Sir Ibrahim's chatting to someone called Connie, who's a criminal he knows. Um, he wants her to do a job for him. And uh, we get this little bit, which just made me chuckle. Um, are there no ethical drug dealers? In Brighton, there's a fair trade cocaine dealer. He gets all his wraps stamped and everything. Cocaine from family-run farms, no pesticides. Oh, that seems like a start, says Ibrahim. He still threw someone off a multi-story car park for stealing money from him. 
Elizabeth gets another a great quote. There's a lots of great one-liners in this. So uh, she says, if murder were easy, none of us would survive Christmas. So we learn a little bit more about Mike Waghorn, the TV presenter. Um, so Mike Waghorn sits in a leather swivel chair in a darkened edit suite. He holds a pen like the cigarette he would dearly love to smoke. But you can't smoke now everyone has an HD television. It's very aging. He should vape. Uh, another great line, this is just from the manuscript, but again, food for thought. If you were disappointed with your face, eventually it shows. So Ron goes off to see uh, Jack Mason, who is kind of a suspect in this murder they're investigating, but also they're old, I guess, not friends, but acquaintances from the dodgier world, you know. And they go to play snooker, which I love because I like watching snooker. Um, but this is also interesting because this kind of covers how men don't really talk to one another anymore. Uh, Jack takes his first shot. Ron is glad they're playing snooker. It can be quite hard for two men to have a conversation together, but snooker or golf or darts always seem to make it easier. Men didn't really meet for a coffee. Perhaps they did these days. Perhaps the coffee shops of Ramsgate were full of men chatting about their hopes and dreams, but Ron doubts it. Ron bends down over the table and takes his shot. And um, it's interesting like the different ways different parts of the book are written. So when it's Joyce, uh, Joyce's section, uh, it's first person, whereas the rest of the time it's third person. Um, so it's just interesting how it, it just is like that for Joyce. Uh, I assume it's a deliberate decision, <laughs> you know. Uh, but she says, I have been Googling, but there's not much out there. I got so desperate, I even used Bing, but the results were the same, if a bit slower. And she wants to meet uh, Fiona Clements, uh, again, another famous person. Uh, and she says, just because I'd like to meet Fiona Clements doesn't mean she isn't a murderer. Lots of famous people are murderers. The Craze, for example. Yeah, very true. I can't fault that logic. Some great little lines here. Uh, Elizabeth hates not knowing secrets. Spies are like dogs. They cannot stand a closed door. Well, that is a little bit like uh, Biggie, I suppose. And then Bogdan uh, is talking to Stephen. Stephen's worried he's losing his marbles because he's, he's basically got dementia. Um, and... Um, uh, Stephen says, Bogdan, old chap, frowning at the chessboard. Looks like you've got me again. Must be losing my marbles. Only thing you're losing is the game, says Bogdan. Uh, my girlfriend and I play the game. So if you play the game and you know what it is, you just lost the game. Sorry. And um, Elizabeth and Joyce get the train into London. And um, there's this just great little mini paragraph. Elizabeth feels the weight of the gun in the handbag sitting on her lap. A gun, a pen, some lipstick and a crossword book. Just like the good old days, we learn a lot about uh Well, we get a lot of these like little references to Elizabeth's past. It's very fun. Uh, Mike, the TV presenter, he says, um, you really pop on camera. I mean, really pop. Last time I saw anything like this, it was a young Philip Schofield, which is kind of unfortunate given recent events with uh, Philip Schofield. They wouldn't have been out in the public eye uh, when this was written. Although, you know, um, Osmond does work in television, so maybe you'd heard rumors. So here we get Joyce's bits and we learn um, the reason why it's in first person is because she's basically writing in her diary. Um, and she's almost writing in real time here, but I like this little line about pause and countdown. I'm back again. Victor has just been to the loo and couldn't get the flush to work. There was a knack and I told him, gentle, 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 then all at once. I told him you can pause the TV when you go to the loo, but he already knew. I pause the TV during countdown just to make it less stressful. If ever I watch it with Ibrahim, he doesn't let me. He says I'm only cheating myself. So Ron ends up going for a massage. I just thought this little passage was quite funny. Ron wishes he was temping bowling, wishes he was anywhere but here. Pauline has persuaded Ron that he might like to have a massage. The air is scented with eucalyptus, heavy and warm, and it thrums and trills with the sounds of the rainforests. He is wrapped fairly insecurely in a thick white towel as he treads barefoot across Moroccan floor tiles beside an azure pool, and he is deeply anxious about how relaxed he is supposed to be feeling. To think he could be interviewing Jack Mason about the murder rather than going through this ordeal. Pauline had asked him if he liked massages, and Ron had told her he had never had one. And Pauline had laughed, and Ron had told her no, he was serious. What would he want a massage for? And she said to treat yourself. And then Ron laughed and said if he was going to treat himself, he'd have a pint. And Pauline said, I'm taking you to a spa. And Ron said, not on your Nelly, not in a million years. And then Pauline kissed him and said, just try it for once for me. And he said no. And then she kissed him again, and now here they are. And of course, he ends up quite enjoying himself. This is deep as well, because Victor and uh, Elizabeth know each other from years back and that's all i'm going to say on that matter um well yeah they're both getting old now and, and we get people drift in and out of your life and when you are younger you know you will see them again but now every old friend is a miracle 
and Ibrahim recruits some help from his, uh, what is it, his nephew or his grandson, I can't remember. I think it's his grandson, uh, Kendrick. And he, he thinks, if ever life seems too complicated, if you think no one can help, sometimes the right person to turn to is an eight-year-old. And Donna, the policewoman, um, she ends up talking to Mike on, the, on, the, on his TV show. And she says, people are much more impressed when you're on TV than when you're catching criminals. Which is depressing, but also true. And we get a reference to a special knock, which is four quick knocks, and it sort of matches the rhythm of the moonpig.com advert, so I guess it's... And we get this, um... Elizabeth and I have been to watch Stop the Clock being filmed. They filmed three episodes, and I saw the second and third one. The first one was interrupted by Elizabeth pretending to faint. All in a good cause, as it turns out. The couple in the second show won £2,700, and they're getting married, so it's going towards their wedding. He must have been 15 years older than her. I know you shouldn't judge, but really, I wanted to shout to her, get out while you can. I mean, that's not far off the uh, age gap between me and, and my girlfriend. And uh, Pauline is there with the uh, Thursday Murder Club, and she says they're all mad. She says, I've known you for just over two weeks, and I've already been in a grave with a KGB colonel. I've seen a tiny old woman drug a Viking, and I've shared a bed with the most handsome man in Kent. For three or four years in the 80s, I did a lot of magic mushrooms. I once did LSD in Bratislava with Iron Maiden, but nothing, nothing I've ever done compares to a couple of days in your company. Cracking line here, the lovely thing about investigating a murder is that you can be nosy and call it work. And we learn... I don't want to spoil who this is, but um, somebody is using a fake name, uh, Alice Cooper. People laughed at her name, but it serves a purpose. Back when she was investigating the VAT fraud, she'd been learning everything she could about money laundering, taking professors and criminals out for lunch, bothering all the experts. A German police investigator had told her that the best alias for a fraudster was that of a famous person. It makes you impossible to Google, he had said, and he was quite right. Google Alice Cooper now and you will have to scroll through an awful lot of pages before you get to her media training and PR solutions company on the 8th floor of an office building in the Dubai Marina. And uh, yes, the crime writer policeman gets in a, bit, a little bit of trouble and we get this. The irony is his books are now huge bestsellers, top of the Kindle charts and some publishing companies rushing out real physical copies too. Netflix have bought the TV rights. It's true what they say about publicity. He's not seeing a penny of the money though. It's all been held by the court until he pays back the 10 million he stole. And he's thinking about potential titles for his next book and he, he writes down Death Comes Knocking. Uh, and that was used as a title by uh, Graham Bartlett and Peter James in there. It's called Death Comes Knocking, Policing Roy Grace's Brighton. They sent me a review copy, it was nice. Uh, and then in the acknowledgements, I just want to highlight here, he uh, he says, I'm indebted once again to the copy editing and production genius of Natalie Wall and Annie Underwood. Natalie is the first person ever to succinctly explain to me when I should be using which and when I should be using that. It is a piece of knowledge that I will always remember. And yet he didn't share it with us, and I, I still struggle with that. I just go with whatever sounds right and natural, which is how I <laughs> figure out a lot of these things. Anyway, The Bullet That Missed by Richard Osman. I would probably give it like a week, four out of five. It was pretty good. It might actually be my favourite of the Thursday Murder Club books so far. But in general, they're just amusing, you know. Um, again, I think I said earlier, if you're looking for purely a mystery novel, you'll be disappointed. If you're looking for purely a, a Kuma novel, you'll be disappointed. If you want something with a little bit of both, this is going to be the book for you. This is going to be the series for you. I understand why he's sold a lot of copies. I don't know why he's sold quite as many as he has, but hey-ho. Uh, and I met him as well, he's very tall. So yeah, there we have it. That's what I made of The Bullet That Missed by Richard Osman. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you've read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.